Good morning. Good morning. Everybody uh, uh, wear enough coats this morning for them. Winter's here again, isn't it? We'd like to welcome all of you this morning, especially our visitors. Uh, if this is your first time here, well, we ask you to sign a visitor's card uh, in the located the pew in front of you. Uh, today, again, uh, we have a welcome uh, Dr. Frank Smith and his lovely wife, Susan. Oh, raise your hand up as so everybody can see you. Okay. Um, Dr. Smith has uh, visited with us last month and delivered our message, and he will be bringing us uh, this morning's message. He's from LaGrange and preaches at a number of different churches around that area. Uh, the offering this morning will be taken uh, by passing the offering plate. Uh, we've gotten away from the one in the back door, by the back door. Uh, following the service, we would invite everyone to please join us in the fellowship hall for snacks and coffee. Uh, there'll be a short uh, council meeting, a call council meeting. So, uh, wanted to make you aware of that. Uh, next Sunday, there will be a brunch to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. So, feel free to bring a covered dish. On Saturday, April the 24th, uh, at 10 o'clock, there'll be a memorial service for Evelyn Herzig here at the church. There will be a luncheon in the fellowship hall following the service. Uh, May the 16th, that's a little far out, but I just wanted you to mark the calendar. Uh, the uh, Feldman uh, scholarship fund recipients will all meet here in the church, the ones from Rice and Columbus and Weimar, to receive their scholarships. Marriott, as you know, and Shirley uh, are behind handling those scholarships. <clears throat> there are six Easter lilies in the fellowship hall left over from Easter. If you own one and want one, get it because they will be there tomorrow, they tell me so. Okay. And there'll be a adult Bible study after fellowship and council meeting this morning. Uh, prayers and concerns. Carolyn Goldstein, we want to remember the Menish family and the Herzig family. The Pittmans, uh, Glory Kane, Ernie Dean, Doris Albright, the Wyndhams, Valerie Watson, the Kasurics, and uh, Ray's sister, Risa. I understand she's doing pretty good. They just came from up there, and so uh, that was some good news. Uh, we also pray for our nation during these turmoil and unrest periods. Is there anything else that anybody needs to bring up? Yes? I'd like to thank everybody for all the nice cards of the church and all the help that I've received in trying to get over my law. Thank you, Emil. Our prayers are with you. If you will all now uh, open your hymnal, open your books to uh, 291, We'll have our opening hymn, Thine is the Glory.
worship and we'll read responsibly. Sing praises to God, ye fa you faithful. Give thanks to God's holy name. You turn our weeping to dancing. God, you remove the garments of mourning and close us and clothe us in gladness. Lord, today we recall your faithfulness. We thank you that you walk with us every day, that you are with us always. We proclaim that your promises are true and your goodness and love never fail. In this moment, we come to you and lay our lives before you. May we honor, worship, and adore you with every fiber of our being. Father, we proclaim that you are the Holy One, the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Your beauty and majesty are beyond compare. On this day, we join with all those who worship and confess you as Lord, from generations past and present, and with all the angels that sing in heaven of your greatness and splendor. Lord, we love you. Lord, we adore you. Lord, we bow down and worship you. Amen. Sit, or you can come sit here, wherever you feel most comfortable. All right. You can tell him later that I didn't bite you. <laughs> Have you ever had a party? Did you invite your friends? When you invited them, did any of them say that they couldn't come? It's kind of disappointing if you were to have a party, especially a special party, and you invited many people and they all had excuses why they couldn't come. How would you feel if that happened to you? You'd be sad. Would you be angry? Well, you might. And if you were, you might have a right to to be treated this way. The parable we're going to study this morning, Jesus tells, is about a party that his father is giving. And he invites all the special invitees, and they all have an excuse and say they can't come. And he's sad, and he's somewhat angry. But what he does is he invites everyone else, everyone who wasn't originally invited, to see if they would like to come. And they do. I hope that when you have parties, your friends all come and that they feel special that you invited them. In fact, God is inviting us all to his party. And it's a party that never ends and it's a party that we don't want to miss. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace and for giving us these children that we can learn from. Lord, we pray that these children will always have time for God. They will have time for you and for your son Jesus and that they will never turn away your appeals to them, your offers to them. And Lord, we are all your children and so we are speaking really for all of us. Help us always to have you first and foremost in our life. We thank you for your invitation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. You will open your hymnals now to 625. Lord, speak to me. <laughs>
Now, if you will, open your bulletin to the prayer of confession, and we'll read together. God, we confess that there are many hours when we are not by the mind of earth. In your mind, we are the Lord, the challenge, and come from your prayer and share. Forgive us and restore the joy of knowing you. May Christ be known among us in the break of our bread. Amen. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 5. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing is in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 1 through 14. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited. See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite them to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man who did not have on the wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus' stories... His parables were fiction, yet they mirrored spiritual realities. The one that we just read in Matthew 22 relates to all of us. Once upon a time, a king threw a banquet celebrating his son's wedding. All who were invited refused to come, and some of them shamelessly abused and even murdered the very messengers who invited them. The king, of course, was furious. 
In a vengeful rage, he destroyed the murderers. He leveled their city. Yet the wedding hall, as we read, was still empty. So he sent out other servants to invite any and every one that they could find. One would never suspect that these folks could attend such a great feast. But they came in droves, and most were delighted to be included. There was, however, one in attendance who didn't bother to clothe himself properly for the occasion. This was an affront to his majesty. That callous guest was thrown out and severely punished. And then there's the story summary. Many are called, but few are chosen. So here's the question I hope we can answer today. For what did God choose me? Or maybe, let me turn this around. For what did God choose you? The word chosen, which can be translated elected, is ripe with theological meaning. Because of that, some people often assign complicated theological explanations to this parable. Before we follow that, let's start with a simple context. Jesus' parable explains the basic process of election. They were invited, and they came. It's really that simple. Many prominent people were invited but refused to come. They were not elected. Others, never deserving an invitation, received one and came gladly. They were elected. One guy came for the wrong reason and without the proper dress of respect. He, as we saw, was rejected. In a nutshell, that's the meaning of election. We can tease out a few other notable statements about election, and we'll do that. At the risk of being overly simple, there are two basic views of election. One, God alone chooses who goes to heaven and who does not. The second is God has determined the parameters of salvation, and we get to choose whether or not we enter. Some very smart, and I will add, godly people differ on the definition of election, and with good reason. With all due respect to other views, we can start with Jesus' own definition of election as drawn from the parable. God's invitation and our acceptance. God determines the time, the place, and the parameters of the feast, of the party. We choose whether we will accept the invitation. Let's clarify a few points. Point number one, everyone is invited. The rich and the poor of the parable all got an invite. Some in Jesus' audience had inherited religious clout. Others were farmers, day laborers. They were outcasts whose daily means of survival might render them unclean. From the top of society to the very bottom, all were invited. After Jesus' day, the church spread across geographical and cultural boundaries. The message went from the Jews first to the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? Basically anyone who wasn't a Jew. The early church was stunned by the breadth of the invitation. It included Gentiles. It included slaves. It included women. All received an invite. Isn't this, after all, the implication of John 3.16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He didn't just love the Jews. <coughs> he loved all. This is also spelled out in 2 Peter 3.9, where Peter says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. According to Scripture, God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 3, excuse me, 2, verses 3 and 4. And this attitude is not new, it's not unique to the Gospels. As far back as Ezekiel, Chapter 18, verse 32. God showed man his cards. I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. 
So turn and live. So, point number one, everyone gets an invitation. Secondly, not everyone gets the same invitation. Not everyone gets the same invitation. God is all-inclusive. However, He is not egalitarian. A few years ago, I had to look up this word because it was being thrown about a lot. Egalitarian. It relates to or a belief that all people are equal and deserve equal rights and equal opportunities. Like I said, it's thrown around a lot today from both sides of the aisle. So let me repeat, God is all-inclusive, but He's not egalitarian. According to the parable, the invite starts with the elite. In historical terms, that means the Jews had greater access to God through the Torah and through the temple. In theological terms, that means that God elected the Jewish people to bear the promise and then handed that off to the Christian church to extend it to all the world. In sociological terms, it means that all economic groups, all tribes, all tongues, and all political affiliations have open access to election but not necessarily equal access. The reality is that those who are born in modern, the modern day West, such as ourselves, we have much more opportunity to hear the gospel and respond freely than those who live in nations, perhaps in the Middle East, perhaps in the Far East, perhaps in our own hemisphere, where that message cannot be shared, where the gospel is not welcome. So we don't all have equal access. Does that mean God isn't fair? Yes, that's exactly what it means. God isn't fair. However, He is gracious to all. For reasons above and beyond our comprehension, God chose a man, Abraham, to father a nation. He chose that nation to build the temple and to preserve the law. From that nation rose a Messiah who would eventually be proclaimed Lord across all continents. This foreordained, foreordained plan of God was immensely gracious, but it was not egalitarian. Third point, you must respond to the invitation. Election is not just the invitation. It is a particular response to the invitation. God alone invites. Humans, however, under God's sovereignty, are obligated to respond. That's why the Bible consistently encourages those who are invited to RSVP. Jesus himself exhorted us, strive to enter through the narrow door, Luke 13, 24. The writer of Hebrews implored, let us draw near, Hebrews 10, 22. Cheerly, excuse me, clearly, the chief weight of responsibility is God's. He does the heavy lifting. But His invitation is not complete without our response. Again, this is nothing new. After Joshua had led his chosen people into the promised land, he gave them this famous challenge, a line in the sand, so to speak. Choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. The fourth point. God knows who will respond. God doesn't force your hand, but He does see it under the table. In other words, He knows what you'll do before you ever do it. This may sound mysterious, but every one of us who, have, who are parents or grandparents have experienced this. You can see your kid and you will know that he or she is about to do something. Maybe they're going to jump. Maybe they're going to reach out and touch something that they shouldn't. Maybe they're about ready to tune up and cry. Or maybe they're ready to succeed and you know that they will because you know them. It's the same with God. However, He sees further out than we do. 
The New Testament calls this foreknowledge. The Greek word literally means knowing beforehand. Peter addressed his first letter to those who are elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. The elect who respond to God's invitation are seen by God long before they ever come to Him. Long before they are even born. That's where the word predestined comes into play. It's a rare Greek word used only six times in the New Testament. It means to determine beforehand. The root is where we get the word horizon. It basically means to set boundaries, to predestine. God determines the boundaries of salvation. He lays out the ground rules. And then He sees who will respond and who will not. His invitation, His call is to all. His election is for those he sees will step into his predetermined boundaries of salvation. Paul in Romans 8 verses 29 through 30 summarized it like this. Those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined he also called. And those whom he called he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. All of this makes sense except for maybe one thing. If God's predestination sets the boundaries of salvation, then his election should be corporate, not individual. In other words, God declares beforehand the kind of people who will be saved. If, however, God starts naming those who are saved, it looks as if he's playing favorites. To be fair, God is God. He gets to do that if he likes. But he isn't like that at all. Not according to the Bible. His love is perfect and universal. Matthew 5.48 John 3.16 God is perfect and he loves all the world. To use the common vernacular of the Bible, in Romans 2.11, Paul says there is no partiality with God. God does not play favorites. His invitation is to all. So what do we do with individual predestination? Both the Old and New Testament highlight names of individuals whom God elected and predestined. The list is long. And this list I'm going to share with you this morning is not all inclusive. Abraham, he was chosen to be the father of a great nation. Jacob, who was renamed Israel and had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes. Pharaoh, he was the foil of, the, of God's people in Egypt. God chose David to be king after Saul. He chose King Josiah. He chose King Cyrus, a Persian king. He chose Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. He chose John the Baptist to be the forerunner of Jesus. He chose Jesus himself to live and to die and to be resurrected for us. He chose Judas Iscariot to play a critical role. He chose the twelve apostles. He chose Paul, an apostle born out of due season. He even chose Rufus. If you're not familiar with Rufus, look him up in Romans 16, 13. We should first notice in this that God ordains individuals to a task, not necessarily a destiny. Like I said, Abraham was called to found a nation. David was chosen to lead the kingdom. And Cyrus was chosen to restore that kingdom after they had been drugged off by the Babylonians he was chosen to send them home. John the Baptist was selected to prepare for Jesus' coming. And Jesus was chosen to die on the cross. Judas was fated to betray Jesus. And all the other apostles 
They were chosen to testify after Jesus' resurrection. Both Paul and Jeremiah were elected from birth to preach a message for which they would suffer. If God calls you to a task, you will in all likelihood perform that task, either His way or yours. Nonetheless, you will likely do what God, God calls you to do. Secondly, we should notice that not everyone gets the same invitation. Remember now, God is not egalitarian. But all will receive an invitation. All have been invited. God has a practical purpose for you in life. God has a practical purpose for you in life. This is not to say that God has just one specific thing you're to do in your entire lifetime. Rather, in every season of your life, God wants you to meet at the intersection of your gifts, your passions, your experiences, perhaps even your vocation, to use the unique you to glorify Him. That's why we are on this earth. There's something right here, right now, that only you can do. Only you can be the one to honor God in that way. When you discover that, you will find your voice, your passion, and your purpose. That's why God has chosen you. He wants you to fulfill the purpose He has for you. So, in summary, here's what I hope we learn today. Number one, according to Jesus, election is God's invitation plus our response. You can't have one without the other. Secondly, predestination is God setting the boundary of salvation and seeing beforehand who would enter in. And thirdly, individuals. We all are predestined to a task, but not necessarily a destiny. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Father, we thank you for the parables of Jesus. We thank you for the deep message that is within his seemingly simple stories. This one in particular, God, shows us that you have prepared for us great things. That you love us greatly and are disappointed when we don't respond properly to your invitation. Lord, we are not only called here to answer the invitation, but also to share the invitation with others who haven't heard or who have forgotten that invitation. Sometimes we just need a reminder. We thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit, God, to guide us, to comfort us, to lead us into doing what is right. We thank you for your church all the saved, the bride of Christ, who also support us. Help us to find our place within the church. Help us to realize that we all have a task and there is no task that is too menial to be unimportant. Thank you for supporting us with your love, your mercy, your grace, your patience, your faithfulness to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
Exodus 23, verse 9. Moses tells the people, The best of the fruits of your ground you shall bring unto the house of the Lord your God. We'll now accept the morning offering.
of life, sustainer of our lives. We thank you for this, this Sunday that we can come together and worship you. As we leave this place, Lord, let us be ready to serve, be ready to share. The invitation is for all, God. Some need to hear it again. Help us to be your messengers. Give us the faith. Give us the, the strength. Give us the wherewithal to be your messengers. And as we leave this page, Lord, place, help us to serve and to deliver the gospel to all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.